Back, I'm Mark Thomas. We're continuing with conversations, and right now, it's appropriate to say, welcome back to Dakota. A band that we heard so much about in uh, the 70s and 80s is back with us again, and back with us are two members of uh, Dakota, Jerry Holutzik. Jerry? How you doing, Mark? I'm good. How are you? Very, very good. And Rick Manwiller? Yes. And Rick, thank you for being with us. Sure. Uh, why are you back, though? I mean, did you ever go anywhere, guys? Well... I guess we never really went anywhere. I mean, we were still in the music business. We never stopped. We're, uh, we're players. We like to play within this game that we started in. And uh, you just kind of take a little different road here and there to survive. But uh, that's what makes, makes it sweet, because when there's an opportunity years later to come back, we took the opportunity and, and went for it. Now, Rick, you guys have uh, enjoyed a lot of success in uh, recent months. Uh, cover of, of magazines throughout Europe, Japan, and uh, what started all of the uh, the resurgence? Um, well, that's kind of more Jerry's ballpark, but we uh, we had been getting airplay in Europe, uh, not so much airplay, but sales. People have been bootlegging Dakota Records for years, and we didn't know anything about it, and he got a call from a, a guy in Sweden who wanted to know if there were any extra pieces of the collection that he didn't own, and uh, we had done an independent thing called Lost Tracks around here back in, what was that, 87? 86, 87. 86, so he told him about that, and one thing led to another, and, um, you know, that's how it started, basically. Basically, uh, through the Internet, uh, this guy in Sweden found out that we had an independent release, which mm -hmm. was that Lost Tracks years ago, and they're big vinyl collectors over there, which they might know something. That's another thing we had talked about, everything coming around, yeah, even with the vinyl. They might know something we don't know because uh, there are a lot of places where you can buy uh, old recordings, virgin vinyl, high-tech, high you know, better vinyl than before, mm -hmm. that it sounds, like I said, there's a lot of people who uh, just like that pure sound, you know, and uh, he had to have this record, so I sent him three copies, uh, so they ended up going, two of the copies ended up going to two of his other friends, who when they were going to school together in Europe, uh, we were one of their favorite groups, just like in the Sticks, Kansas, Toto, Chicago food group type thing. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another and they, you know, they told us that uh, we used to wear your records out at parties, you know, to the point where I was getting a little embarrassed already, you know, and I thought it was kind of neat, but it was, it was weird. Uh, so to make a long story short, uh, that album, uh, we had the masters uh, and I licensed that project to them, mm -hmm. uh, of which, oh, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now uh, they're all in the record business over in Europe and small independent labels and stuff like that. But uh, so I licensed them the project and uh, they repackaged it, remastered it. It came out uh, titled Mr. Lucky, which was one of the cuts on the, on the Lost Tracks. And I figured, well, we, it's a win-win. We have nothing to, to lose. And I, and I figured that, uh, you know, that would be the end of it. I'd get sent my promo copies and that would be it. But see, Dakota uh, kind of fizzled uh, by the time the CD revolution came in. So none of the Dakota records were ever on CD. So I figured, well, at least the independent one would, would go on CD. And uh, I got the promo copies. And that was August of, 80, uh, August of 96 it came out. And by Thanksgiving of that year, I mean, I got calls from Sweden, from Belgium, just from Spain. Up. It just, you know, it, to a point, you know, not huge numbers, but I mean, enough numbers where we had talked over Christmas uh, to do a uh, brand new studio record, of which we hadn't done a studio record together as a band uh, since 1984. Yeah. The Lost Tracks was just a bunch of demos with a drum machine uh, and just rough recordings of what would have been the... Uh, uh, the follow-up to Runaway on MCA in 1984, and uh, so that was we went. Done in a walk -in closet. Yeah, that was that was done in a uh, <laughs> in his apartment actually, and uh, so we went with it. And I c called him and told him what was going on with uh, the Mr. Lucky, and never knowing that it would go beyond that. Yeah. Uh, and then at Christmas uh, they gave us a small budget to go in and, and do an, another record. And I called him, and I said, uh, I decided I'm going to do this you know, with or without you. I hope it's with you, you know. And, uh, and uh, because, you know, like I said, uh, we've, we've gone through a lot over the years and uh, it seems like we've always managed to come out on the other side of things and I think we work really well together. And uh, I was really happy that uh, a couple of days later he said, yeah, let's do it. And uh, that was the last standing man. In fact, we hadn't, uh, we played together for years and then probably for the last four or five years we decided that uh, 
it was time to do other things. Yeah. He wanted to travel, work on a solo project. I wanted to get off the road. I wanted to do some producing and everything. So it was just, it was, it was time. And uh, we only live three miles from each other, you know, all these years. And uh, the first session that we got together, the first writing session after we decided we're going to, you know, embark on this on this journey, uh, he had a musical track. And I had an idea for, uh, you know, a lyrical idea, and that was the first night. Last Standing Man was born, and you know, it was all smooth sailing after that until we got in here, and you know, week after week after week, it just. Yeah, how many months, Rick? Said about seven months on and off. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. But the next one is going to be cut in half. Yeah, <laughs> six months tops. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, what about, uh, you know, you, you, I guess at some point you figure, all right, that part of my life, that part of my career is over. It's behind me. I'm moving on to other things. You too, Jerry. Moving on to other things. And all of a sudden, I mean, you can't get away from it. You, you Either you kept going back to it or keep going back to it or somebody else keeps dragging you back to it. And maybe drag's not the right word, but somebody else does something that brings it all back again. Mm -hmm. What is it? Artistically, it's difficult, too, because you try to, at the point when we broke up... Uh, Dakota, uh, we had done a band called Secret City with a, a friend of ours, guitar player. Hi, Eric. And uh, we were trying to fit what was going on in, in, the, in the current scene. That was what that was in the late '80s. Yeah. And it was uh, it wasn't new wave. What was big then? That was well, new wave was uh, well. The reason uh, not to get off, you know, your, your train of thought, <laughs> but the the reason why Dakota after the Queen tour in 1980, in the early '80s, mm -hmm. kind of was not re-signed by Columbia because this new wave punk scene was coming yeah. in, and we weren't in in their plans. Yeah. So getting back to his thought, we were at the tail end of it yeah. with the Secret City thing. Go well, ahead. The point is, we were, we put a new band together to try to get a new sound and try to match yeah, what was on the radio. Fresh. And uh, then that kind of fizzled out, and we went, and then years later, all of a sudden, you want you find a whole market of people who want what you did 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's refreshing, and yet it's confusing, because you've been thinking 90s, 90s, and we've got to do this kind of thing and that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden you say, oh, all that stuff we used to do now is hip again, you know, so then everything's in cycles anyway, so. And, and the thing of it is, we're, uh, like I said, we're, we're players. We're, we like to be in that game, you know. We've, uh, I, this is what I've done right out of high school same thing with him this is what we do for a living you know whether it's you know the Dakotas or uh, we had a publishing deal with MCA of Nashville uh, he and I wrote some songs for the Oak Ridge Boys we get, went into the country thing we've done jingles uh, yeah. you know the, the Hatchie Malachi for uh, uh, you know Channel 16 you know years ago uh, when they did the Walt Disney stuff they they came to us and said well we want kind of a cross between what Dakota would do and whatever they didn't know but with the walt disney's uh, uh cartoons and everything you know we came up with that it ran three years we do a lot of jingles uh one of them which it's amazing it's still being played uh, that johnson technical institute i mean 10 years later you that know? was an original rock song we yeah wrote, actually really? that uh, we needed the jingles like well we got this thing started and we'll take that you know? but i mean it was it's uh, we've always we've always done whatever it took to kind of stay active you know in this in this area, in this you know uh, uh, arena of, of music, and if you stay in something long enough, as you know, with everything, it's we were talking about before. Everything seems to come around only yeah, because obviously. that generation you know loses its music, its this, its cars, its you know whatever. But then you know you're at a point where you want it back. You know you have your own kids and whatever, but you still want to have ties to your, you know, to your yeah. youth. So these things keep popping up. So we just happen to be still here. So Last Standing Man is, you know, classic Dakota, classic, classic rock. Classic rock. And, Mainstream and, uh, rock from like the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. And we probably played it a little a little safe, and that was probably uh, either my plan or my fault, one of the two, because I wasn't sure exactly what they wanted over there. And I thought, since this was the first Dakota record that uh, basically I, I did without, you know, Kelly, it was something that I had to revert back to the 1984 Runaway album, of which uh, that's the, that was the last thing that we did as a group on major label. Yeah. So I figured, well, I want to want to go back and make it uh, a little more lyrically uh, solid as far as talking about uh, uh, subjects that you know that, that meant something. Yeah. You know, the, what Last Danny Man is about, what Mama Teach on the record about. You know about having kids and like letting them go and yeah. the whole thing. You know, uh, whereas 
uh, not to disrespect any of the old Dakota because you know we were signed to major labels and it was good for the time. But when I look back on them, there was too much of the you know uh, I love you, sound. you love me. You know, it was yeah. it was the sound more than the lyrical content. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had to keep the sound of which uh, I told him this many times. Uh, I I don't know if I can write any different. When we write together, it's. We, even if we didn't want to sound like Dakota, this is what comes out. This is the Dakota, and I think this this new record, uh, it was one of my personal favorites. And we've made some you know good records before that I was very proud of, and it's a part of my past. And I'm, like I said, I, I uh, I'm very proud of that that uh, body of work, but this one seems to be you know more grown up. It's where I thought Dakota would have been.